You may not even realize it, but computers are everywhere around you. The car that your parents or even you drive, the refrigerator in your kitchen, everything's got a computer embedded in it. The way I see it, computing really is the future. I am a software development engineer at Amazon. Began making uh, computer games as a teenager and ultimately went to the, uh, the Ying Wu College of Computing. I did my research in an area called computing education research. So the reason I got into this field is because I was a TA for introductory programming course when I was at UC San Diego, and I found that a lot of people came in with these preconceived notions about computer science being too difficult, uh, that it wasn't for them, it was only for their smart friends, it was only for boys, and I definitely don't think this is the case. When I was applying to colleges, NJIT was the obvious choice for me. I'm in college to learn how to be a great computer scientist, and I was convinced when I visited NJIT that this would be the place to do it. I am director of the NJIT Cybersecurity Research Institute. My particular claim to fame is I ran one of the early implementation teams for a kind of technology called homomorphic encryption. I recently co-founded a startup called Duality Technologies. Dean Craig Gotsman, he has been especially supportive of faculty entrepreneurship. His experience has been extremely useful to me as I integrate students into research that I do that would have broader societal benefit. In my experience so far, there's been a huge welcoming community between the advisors and the fellow students. Not just fresh undergraduates, but even students that have been in the career for a long period of time and are coming back to school. I think this tight-knit community here at NGIT is really open and they're here to welcome you, whether you're trying to study or pursue your thesis or dissertation. All these options are available for you and we're all here to help. Ranging from the very philosophical to the very technical, there's a very broad range of things that you can do. Um, people normally think of computing as something that only geeks and nerds do, and to some extent that's not completely uh, incorrect, but computing is used in fashion, computing is used in sports. Um, we have uh, several sports-related projects going on. Computing is used in gaming, entertainment, um, health, there's a lot of different applications for computing. My classes and my colleagues' classes are specifically designed around the, the career prospects of the students. The main job market happens to be mobile, augmented, and virtual reality, so we start right on the phone. Mobile development, we move right through augmented reality on the phone, we move into virtual reality on the phone. We give you all the skill sets that you need as a designer and as a developer. I personally came from this college. I found that the quality of education and the price point, its connection, the transportation to New York City was a, a great opportunity for me for internships. I have classmates who went to, some went to Google, some are at Microsoft, uh, Verizon, a number of uh, various companies. Uh, so definitely, definitely a lot of, a lot of opportunity coming out from NJIT. <laughs> Greetings from New Jersey Institute of Technology. My name is Mike Smullen. I'm the Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office at NJIT, and I'm very proud to welcome you to our latest Highlander chat. Our guest today is Dr. Margarita Vinikoff. She's an Assistant Professor in the Department of Informatics at NJIT's Ying Wu College of Computing. She joined the university from the National Research Council of Canada, where she was a Human Factors Research Officer, specializing in cross-reality and immersive displays, including flight and driving simulations. Dr. Vinikov has extensive experience in prototyping and developing experimental platforms for virtual simulations. She studies human-computer interaction with an emphasis on visual and audio perception. She's researched gaze contingent multi-sensory immersive environments which change a display based on the user's gaze location. Her research has been published in journals such as the International Journal of Human Computer Studies and the ACM Transactions on computer human interactions. Dr. Vinikov, welcome to the Highlander chat today. And Dr. Vinikov, just make sure that you unmute yourself as we begin our session. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, so it's super exciting to be here and I'm really excited to share my research. And there's a lot of things I would like to share. So let me just start right away. Um, Okay. And 
Okay. So the theme of our uh, talk today, of my talk today, is application of extended reality and the power of human gaze. So I just want to warn you, there will be a lot of applications that I would like to share with everyone in here. And um, I'll try to give a taste of a lot of little things. Uh, feel free to pop in and ask questions, uh, but uh, leave the majority of questions probably to the end. So again, my name is Margarita Vinikov. I host here at NJT an interactive cross-reality lab. And my plan is to give you just uh, a set of definitions that I would like you to be aware of when I'll be showing all the applications. And then I want to show you as many applications as possible that are happening in our lab and uh, just really to give you a taste what we're doing here at NJT. So let me start by uh, just ask you in general, what do you know about extended reality? So when we're thinking about extended reality, what are applications are popping into mind? Uh, you can think about cell phones, you can think about oculuses and rifts and uh, head mounted displays, large installations. And uh, this is all that we're doing here at the lab. Just to give a set of references, you can think about yourself sitting now at your uh, desktop or on the couch, and uh, this is your real life. On the other hand, if you put a helmet, a head-mounted display, uh, you might go somewhere where it's a completely different reality, a completely different world like dinosaurs or any other monsters of your liking um, and, and completely forget about the boring office or living room that you're in right now. But if you do like your living room, you can uh, get a part of mixed reality where you mix your cozy uh, seating living room and all the, the monsters and dinosaurs that you can think of. And our, in our lab, we're, we're really doing a mix of all of those. We're also doing a lot of augmented reality. And in some cases, it is augmented virtuality that we're dealing with. Now, my biggest interest is really in human attention. And uh, what's attention? Well, attention is a cognitive operation that allows you to uh, select and filter uh, only the important information and ignore all the other things that are happening around us. Because even if you think about visual attention, uh, our eyes are get so overwhelmed with the amount of signals that are getting uh, that you see uh, the, the sky, you see the, the, the floor, you see so many different colors. Uh, and But in essence, uh, all you need is right now just to turn your attention to me and to my talk. And so how our brain is doing that, uh, this is really a uh, conversion into visual attention. Of course, uh, there's other types of attention and there's auditorial uh, attention. Uh, but because we're all right now dealing with a lot of uh, virtual and augmented realities, uh, most of the resources right now go into visual attention. And so I really like this quote that it's really a mechanism that turns looking into seeing. And what does it help us to do that? Well, it's our eyes. Everything starts with the back of our eye where we have a lot of receptors. And what's really interesting about the human eye uh, is the fact that our receptors that receive light are not uniform, not in the amount and not in the type of receptors that we get in our eye. So uh, I don't know how many of you are doing uh, eye exam. You should uh, do that at least uh, every two years. Uh, it's even recommended to do it every year. Uh, and um, some uh, ophthalmologists uh, would show you that picture of the back of your eye. And if you really look at that, you will see that in the center of our eye, in the center of our vision, we get a lot of receptors. And that's called the fovea. And uh, the amount of receptors there allow us to see at the highest quality that we're actually seeing. So you can read, you can um, 
do any other interesting actions with your vision you can um shred a saw um do do some arts and crafts whatever you like to do and then as things go to the side actually you can see that our vision drops but that's not quite true because we just get different types of receptors and those receptors are responsible for you detecting motion and detecting very faint light so if you want to see stars at night uh, don't look directly at the stars but look off to the stars and you will see them so much better because uh, our receptors at our periphery uh, are even uh, better at detecting light uh, they can detect color and find details but they can detect light now we also have a location in each of our eye that is a blind spot so you actually don't see anything and everyone can do an experiment where you close one of your eyes you extend your hand and you slowly move your finger to the side there will be a point where your finger will disappear i can guarantee that but just do that with one eye uh, but yet we don't see any of those changes so this is how our receptors look like on our uh, um, at the back of our eye you see they're not uniform and yet we perceive our environment very uniform how does this happen well that happens because of our ability to move our eyes and so only in the area where we move and we focus our attention that's where we get the highest level of details and then if we want to see something else we need to move our eyes to get that's why it's so important that we are able and can do uh good eye movements um if uh for some reason due to injury we cannot move our eyes uh it, it becomes much harder for us to uh get that image there's different visual diseases uh that can affect vision and can affect our uh, performance in uh, daily life. So again, that's why I recommend to you to get checked yearly to uh, not to get to uh, that level of um, uh, blindness. Uh, but this is something that's really of interest to me. And so uh, one of the applications that you can uh, do then with uh, the knowledge that uh, our eye is not uniform and we need to move our eye to different directions in order to get a full picture, we can uh, then utilize displays that are called gaze contingent displays. Some of you might know those as foveal displays, but foveal displays are not as... Um, in sync and automated as gaze contingent display. So you, you heard this word so many times by now, gaze contingent displays, what are those? Gaze contingent displays are displays that are changing based on where you're looking. So I'll give you one more example of that uh, because you can simulate various phenomena. then uh, you can simulate normal vision or you can simulate low acuity vision for people. You can simulate various scotomas that happens when people lose their vision. Or you can even simulate uh, visual distortions that happens in early onsets of uh, various uh, visual diseases. And again, people usually don't notice those things because um, you, you move your eye a little bit more to compensate. Uh, but then we can simulate those things by putting an eye tracker or people's uh, heads and uh, make people drive with a very limited field of view, for example, and see how they're doing. So this is one example that you can use uh, when uh, uh, you, you simulate your various visual defects uh, in a gaze contingent onset. But we also have other uh, physiological phenomena, for example, depths of field. A lot of you are probably familiar with depths of field from photography, but this is our ability of our eye to fixate on certain objects. So again, you can stretch uh, your arm and your finger and look at your finger and you will notice that everything behind and in front of your finger is blurred. 
and and that's usually what you get with a good lens and, and a good camera but our eye is doing this on a continuous basis one of the problems in uh, a lot of especially virtual reality setups that our eye regardless of how we perceive things in front or behind the screen uh, is always fixating at the screen and people get very sick and they cannot tolerate uh, 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 stereo displays for a very long time so one of the solutions for that is to simulate depth of field so again, you, we can do that by tracking people's gaze. And uh, if you see and follow the star, you will see that the objects that you're looking are sharp and everything in front and behind of the object is blurred. And you can do that and then you will uh, elevate uh, the sense of um, uh, uh, sickness and, and conflict that people experience uh, because we, we can provide a little bit more information. The interesting part that we actually did with uh, this simulation is that even if we don't have a stereo video that people look at, if we stimulate uh, this depth of field in real time on a 2D screen, people perceive more depths than they would have otherwise. So in a way, it's, it's a way to cheat the system and get a little bit of uh, 3D display uh, just uh, from simulating uh, the depth of field. You can go even further and use our eyes to help us with audio attention. And so you can then alter various sounds and uh, various information based on where people are looking. So it's not necessary only the visual deformation or changes that you do on the screen, but you can uh, change uh, what people are hearing based on what they're doing. So I actually build a system like that. And um, I'll, I'll give you just an example of an absolute example of, uh, and I think everyone would like to do that, is when uh, a person is looking at various speakers and you only see, and you follow the cursor, uh, you only hear the ones that you're looking at. So maybe uh, I'll, I'll show you one more. Uh, this is a partially uh, similar uh, experiment, but at this time, uh, the sound is partially cut off. Okay, so uh, you, you really can change the content. Of course, this was fairly boring experiment that we conducted, uh, but you can think about all the computer games and so much clutter that you can get in the virtual environment or even on your computer. And with a little bit of eye tracking, you can uh, really eliminate all the noise and, and all the background things just to concentrate on things that are important. What else can we do with our attention? Like why our attention is so important? Well, we can leave uh, and think about our life right now. Uh, one of the things that is so important for us to pay attention, and you probably hear that a lot, is uh, in driving. And then you also need to really pay attention while you're walking in a very busy street and you try to navigate uh, to get to a bus stop or to a store. So I, I want to take a, a couple of minutes break and would like to allow Pedro Ramos to uh, talk about another research that we're doing here in the lab that concentrates specifically on uh, driving. Pedro? Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Hello? OK. Uh, do you want me to share my screen for the thing? Yes, please. OK. Okay, welcome to my presentation. This is VR visualization of distracted driving sponsored by Dr. Vinikov. 
I'm Pedro Ramos, and with the help of my team, Adam Wani and Carrie Reed, and past developers, we have together put a project we're very proud of. Distracted driving is a growing problem throughout the NJ region, which can lead to crashes. The purpose of this project is to develop a virtual reality visualization tool to demonstrate to young drivers that even simple distractions can lead to a very severe consequences. This uh, project was created inside the IXR lab under the supervision of Dr. Vinicott to simulate distracted driving. It was initially funded by NJTPA to improve safety and reduce crashes. My team's objective for this project is to update the existing VR driving simulator. The key features for this project are adding all VR headset capabilities using Unity's OpenXR. It is now possible to integrate a plethora of VR peripherals to allow all aspiring users to work with our software. Xbox's wireless steering wheel has recently been added to the project and many users will find it immersive. Eye tracking is the latest technology in the world of VR and has broadened our horizons on what can be done. We implemented several distraction activities that a driver may be engaged with. This includes walking pedestrians, a phone ringing inside the vehicle, rolling trash cans, and weather conditions. Here we can see now that uh, weather conditions and different times of the day are implemented within the scenes. This allows for not only an immersive experience, but also a way to distract drivers with harsh or calm weather conditions. New modes such as a wonderful sunny day, a meek raining evening, snow and a night mode have been added for full immersion. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we've done everything in our power to provide a uh, near perfect distracted driving scenario to properly gauge a user's reaction to the hurdles we've created in the environment. With added features such as previously stated from a multitude of VR devices and controllers, we've also implemented cutting edge steering wheel controls. Oh, wait, sorry about that. Uh. We've also implemented cutting edge steering control, which will uh, being able to grab all parts of the steering wheel rather than previous technologies, which only allowed for two fixed points. This provides a more realistic driving experience for the user, as even the steering wheel, if let go, will return to its original position. Okay. This project previously supported a wired Logitech steering wheel where the input was handled using Logitech's gaming SDK. But now with native Unity methods for the input, wireless steering is possible. Here we can see our user interface menu and toggling the steering wheel button now supports both the wired and wireless steering wheel. A steering wheel within the grip of your hands provides a realistic experience, a realistic experience in controlling their vehicle. We can now see how effortlessly we're able to make sharp reaction times, averting, uh, avoiding all hurdles within the scene. Pupil eye tracking is amazing. The glasses are comfortable and don't get in the way, contributing to the immersion of our simulator. This makes for a great tool to record what drivers are looking at in any given situation, providing an easy way to collect data from users' gaze and gather for data analysis. Our goal is to achieve a better understanding of what causes distracted driving. Here we will see how calibration works with the pupil headset to track data within our sim.
Toby Eye Tracking makes a great addition to this project. Implementing full functionality does not require further peripherals, since it can be used with pre-existing hardware, as well as providing data collection in a similar fashion to the Pupil Eye headset. Here we're, um, let's see. Here we have a video demoing the gaze calibration. And uh, on the far right, we can see uh, in real time how setting up the calibration is simple to use and quick within the headset. Here we're adjusting the headset up and down to fit the frame, as well as adjusting the knob so that the following indigo point is within gaze for accuracy and precision for full calibration. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Team IXR, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Now I'll be passing this back to. Uh, Thank you, Pedro. Uh, it was it was great uh, show off of technology and uh, the actual things that we are doing. And uh, we we really build on top of this, not only just having. Uh, uh, driving simulator but what else can you do with that well you can really then extend this and help designers also understand what people are doing uh, better when driving so not only provide a personal experience but we can extend this to uh, then to designers to really understand better the, the human uh, performance and vision so I already talked about human capabilities of the eye, uh, but I'll just remind you again when you're going to an eye doctor and then they uh, check uh, if you can see letters at various sizes, at various distances. But in reality, we don't always see black and white contrast. In real life, we also see things that um, are uh, at the various levels of uh, contrast, and especially that happens in uh, bad weather conditions when things are foggy, or uh, when um, you you start introducing our uh, clothing that also can merge and blend within the environment. Sometimes it's good, like in military condition, but if you are in urban settings, we all know that it's not safe, and so. Um, we also need to understand that we have different populations. Uh, children actually don't have a very good vision. And unfortunately, as we age, we also, again, lose our ability to see things very clearly. So how would then designers design better things to help us understand uh, the environment around us? So we build a special platform where um, and together with uh, Matthew Schwartz uh, from the College of Architecture and Design here also at NJIT, we built a whole uh, CD that we can evaluate uh, as visibility, not in terms only of various um, things that can occlude our vision or uh, various factors such as sun and uh, incline, but we also can incorporate weather conditions and uh, fog conditions to really understand what is visible within the sea uh, given a certain weather conditions. So again, you, you can uh, combine this uh, with various methods and uh, you can do that in a virtual reality and you can do that in augmented reality. So this is for an outdoors, but what happens if you start looking at indoors? We had a couple of projects that uh, looked at uh, various enclosed space and activities in enclosed space to really understand uh, what people are doing. And so I would like to uh, invite Kian uh, in to this part, and he would talk about uh, our research that we have done to understand urban devotion through the eyes of the observers. Kian, please. Thank you, Professor, um, for the introduction. Um, so. Um, our study, Understanding Urban Devotion Through the Eyes of the Observer. Uh, so basically the main motivation behind this study was to basically see how uh, 
you know, devotion to a monument or a spiritual environment in general uh, could be altered when that environment is restored uh, or repaired, uh, usually uh, by uh, municipal uh, officials. So basically, uh, to answer this question, address this question, we should uh, have to break this down into a more generalized question of how religious practice and individual differences in general um, are related to uh, one's perception of a uh, given environment, which in here is um, a shrine environment, a street shrine environment in the city of Rome, and was uh, captured using uh, photogrammetry methods and uh, 3D mapping methods uh, by our uh, colleagues in the uh, College of Architecture, and uh, was basically brought to life, it was captured, and so we were able to import this environment into uh, uh, a game engine, in this case, Unity game engine, and made us uh, made this possible for us to um, present this environment to our participants in a realistic and real world like uh, experience. Uh, as you can see, this is an overall view of the uh, environment that we captured, and we put it in the uh, basically virtual reality. So uh, the other thing is the uh, perception of that environment. We uh, captured that, um, or we were trying to quantify that using um, one's visual activity, and that was also possible uh, thanks to the eye tracking um, devices that were embedded inside the HTC Vive Eye Pro uh, headset that we were used. And you are now seeing a um, uh, basically a video of it uh, of one of our participants uh, moving in environment. So we basically matched that environment, that shrine environment, we constructed a shrine environment into our real world environment and asked our participant to freely discover the environment and give it a shot. Um, so yeah, and this is also a uh, recording of what participants were seeing um, throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout the study. As you can see, this is from the first person view of the participants. That's how they, they were able to discover the environment, very real world, very normal and um, perfectly actually captured the essence and the environment and atmosphere of the environment. And at the same time, remember, we are collecting the uh, visual activity of that person. So we hope to find a uh, basically correlation between the religious practices that we previously and after the uh, task asked from participant and find a correlation between the visual activity and their perception of that environment. So we can address our uh, main question in this way. Perfect. Um, so here, um, this is a um, image of basically visualization of uh, gaze points that participant basically traces of their part of our participant gaze points inside the environment. As you can see, these red points are um, our participants' raw gaze data. Uh, basically, the collision of their gaze with the environment. Uh, so we needed to do uh, some extra process in this um, data to make sense of it and see if there is anything significant in terms of visual activity there going on. So fixation also, just quick definition, are basically our ability to maintain our gaze uh, on a certain part of the scene for a certain period of time. Uh, and it's been controlled by our, you know, neural mechanisms that we have in our uh, brain. So in terms of the um, what we came up with, um, we basically um, found that the number of fixations, so just the count of the fixation that participant had in, in the environment and their fixation duration on the uh, basically most contextual part of the uh, shrine, the part of the shrine that Mary statue was uh, located on, uh, was correlated with our participants' um, subjective report of recognition of that uh, part of the shrine. So we found out that if people who recognize that uh, Mary statue in the shrine basically uh, had higher number of fixation, higher fixation duration on that certain AOI or area of interest inside the environment. And also we found out that people of the age between 50 to 64 um, had higher number of fixations on that regions of AI. So basically it tells us that how demographics and uh, individual differences are playing a role here in guiding your attention, your visual activity in a given environment with very certain uh, contextual information. 
and also we found that uh, people who identified with a religious community uh, had higher average uh, fixation uh, duration on uh, uh, Mary AOI, as we call it, or you can think of it as a contextual, very high information part of the uh, astronomy. And also the other um, metric that we used was time to the first fixation, and it basically measures the time that it takes for a person uh, to have their first fixation on a given uh, part of the scene and given information. We found out that people who identified with religious community had the lowest time to the first fixation on the Mary AOI in the shrine. One interesting, or let's say anomaly, in terms of expectations, in, uh, what we found was that uh, people who defined, again, subjectively uh, reported, defined themselves as spiritual. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, they had basically lower uh, average fixation time, uh, although we expect that, okay, people are defining themselves in spiritual. So this is the other part of the data. Of course, we need um, to, to a bit maybe broad, broaden our uh, uh, number in terms of number of participants in our study to um, be more, uh, you know, sure about these results and uh, can uh, expand it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kian. So this is just one example of uh, what you can do once you uh, simulate uh, the environment in the virtual reality and, and start learning uh, about the environment uh, just as you put people in as if you had them uh, directly shipped to Rome. Uh, Another thing that we're doing here at the lab, we're doing a lot of STEM research education uh, in the virtual environments. And uh, this is the work that I've done with collaboration with uh, Eric Nassarian and uh, Jessica Ross Nassarian, Adam Sprivitsky and uh, Michael Lee. Um, there's a lot of work on how do you teach children uh, in the, the virtual environments. And uh, Eric and Jess have developed uh, this application called Cspresso. Uh, and you can see here an example of how things looked originally when they just started developing them and what uh, a collaboration between uh, colleges, again, uh, our college and the College of Architecture and Design uh, together can yield a very futuristic looking environment. But the essence of the application is to teach children a binary math and by doing that, they have to play with various levers uh, and uh, they need to, to go in a circle and select uh, the, the color that um, the, the task is given to them. Then they need to select the number of items that they need to generate. Then they need to select what shape they need to generate. And at the end, um, just really bring uh, their results to an output machine that tells them if their answer is correct or not. What's really interesting to us as researchers is to see the path of navigation of children that as they were walking between stations. So not only using uh, students' gaze, but also the physical location to really understand what's going on. And I don't have here a full picture of things, but I show you a perfect uh, circle that they would do in time as they f go through the station. The interesting part that uh, at the beginning, when they were learning how to uh, use the, the machines and in essence learning binary math, they would make a lot of mistakes. And instead of this really nice pentagon that you see in here, you will see a lot of squiggly path. Also, once they learn things, they start uh, going uh, silly and they would start uh, misbehaving. And then again, that would be reflected in those paths. So it's really interesting to learn uh, people's behavior in the virtual spaces because uh, they don't usually communicate uh, to the, the people outside. And especially if you are just interacting with the virtual system on uh, the comfort of your own home. But uh, the system can learn a lot with subtle cues that you can get from people, the way they, they look at things, the way they walk around.
this is also an example of C Presso that was converted into an augmented reality book. Um, the final thing that I want to talk today is not only we, we talked about uh, attention in terms of our uh, gaze and in terms of our body, but I also want to talk a little bit about eye-hand coordination. So what can you do and what can you learn about eye-hand coordination? So one of the projects that we're currently working on uh, is medical ontology. And medical ontology, it's a system that uh, represents uh, medical terms we can always talk about COVID uh, in terms of very complex graphs. Any science can be uh, abstracted into a level of ontology. And uh, once you do that, you get millions and millions of nodes. So how do you navigate those nodes and how do you interact with those nodes in the 3D environment? So for example, you can use a Zoom. Uh, to go and try to look at the far away um, items. You can also bring uh, a keyboard into the virtual environment and type instructions or type the names of the nodes uh, that you want to find in those huge, massive uh, graphical environments. Uh, last thing that you can do, you can make people play chess and look at uh, their hand and eye coordination. So um, I'll just show you a little snippet of what's going on. You will also recognize the eye trackers that uh, Pedro was talking about, uh, but I'll get, sorry, I'll get just to uh, an interesting part, is the, the chess game that you can play, and you can then see what people are looking at, and, um, what if they're looking at their hands what their hands motion what their gaze motion and it's really important especially in uh, the realm of rehabilitation to uh, understand how people uh, move uh, and coordinate their gaze and their hands uh, because especially for stroke patients you really want to to help them to regain uh, the coordination that they had uh, before strokes so I uh, want to thank my team of uh, two capstone uh, teams for this year and also Kia, my graduate student, for putting a great work this semester. Uh, usually uh, you would see our labs uh, filled with students and filled with a lot of exciting work. It has been slowed down due to COVID this year, but we're looking for uh, the lab to get filled again and having a lot of exciting experiments coming up next. Um, I also um, would like to let you know that we're always in a search uh, for participants. So if you would like to try any of those applications that I have showed you and help the science, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me and uh, we can uh, talk about those uh, opportunities. Uh, I'm also always looking for industrial partners to collaborate. So if you have an exciting uh, project, a VR or augmented reality project uh, that you would like to bring to our lab to help you to develop it or to look at the human uh, computer interaction aspect of it and help you to improve the quality of the product, we're always very interested to that. We're also looking for uh, industrial partners to collaborate for fundings. Uh, and we're, we're in general very open for people to come and see what we're doing in our lab. So at this, I will stop and I'll answer any questions. So Dr. Vinikov, I uh, want to point out to the alums who are watching that those are fantastic opportunities for alumni to become involved in the work you do. And I'll be happy to promote this uh, after the conclusion of the event. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up some of the questions we've received up on the screen. We see Wind and Kite Surfer on YouTube has asked, do the eye tracking devices pose any danger to the eye? Not sure how they work. Can you describe how they work in a way that they're not going to damage the eye? Of course. So there's different eye trackers. Uh, there are some of them are called low light and high light. Some of them are based on um, 
various infrared uh, lights that goes into your eyes and reflects back. Uh, usually uh, the light that is projected into your eye is not dangerous. Uh, it might dry a little bit your eye, uh, but just very little. So you can really go for hours wearing the eye tracker and uh, there's no uh, danger to your eyes. Um, there are also camera eye trackers. They're not as accurate. Uh, but they're also possible that so they're totally ininvasive in, in any way. Uh, there are invasive eye trackers as well, uh, but they're usually used in uh, labs for very, very specific purposes. Uh, but if we're, they're not available for the general public in general. Um, so the way the eye tracking is generally working, there's two parts that uh, we're doing and looking for. We're always looking for a pupil. So there's a live image detection uh, and you just look and you approximate the curvature of the pupil. But that's the easy part. You also want to understand where is the center of your eye. And if you remember one of my slides, you have the eye is actually in a spherical apple, right? And so you want to approximate from just the pupil that you see at the front, where is the center, the axis of the eye? And that happens when uh, you do emit light inside um, a human eye and the infrared light reflects back. And that the difference between where you emitted the light and where the light was reflected back, they're called the Purkinje images. Uh, that helps us to really approximate made the angle that the eye is looking at. And we're usually talking about uh, angles rather than in specific positions because uh, things can be at a different distances from people. And so angle, visual angles are the easier way to uh, say what the eye tracker is collecting. So it seems as though there is enough of a distance and even so the technology used is not going to necessarily damage the eye. Uh, just out of curiosity, has that technology changed over the last four or five years where there have been increasingly less invasive uh, ways to do this? Or has this pretty much been a, um, a static way to track eye movements for quite some time? Well, it's definitely became less invasive, but I would say it became less invasive even 10 years ago. I mean, uh, the, the early technology goes about uh, 100 years ago. Uh, with very early photography, and then it was fairly invasive. Uh, right now, uh, for the last 10 years, I would say, or even 15 years, uh, most of the technology is non-invasive. And uh, the only improvement that happened in the, over the last decade is, of course, the accuracy. And... Um, the the how would I say it the commercial uh, commercialized availability to the user so uh, usually an eye tracker used to cost about thirty k right now you can uh, get that inside a head mounted display in the cost of just uh, a, a friction of what you usually get in the labs. That's remarkable. Um, it, speaking of that advance in technology, uh, Sayili on our. YouTube page asks actually two questions, but the first is, how do you store live data if the person is hyperactive? So if your eyes are moving a lot um, and there's a lot of pupil activity, so does that data in a live format get analyzed by a, a big data sort of system? Is it a challenge to do that, to save it, and to analyze it? Okay, so in general, we like to collect a lot of eye data. Our eyes, again, because we, you see the world so uniformly, our eyes working very hard to move a lot. So uh, we collect uh, at a very high frequency eye data, regardless of what your uh, gaze activity is doing. So you might be still, but we're still collecting a lot of eye data. So you can't scare us with, with, with the, the amount of data that you get. Uh, the question is then, what do you do with that data? And a lot of time, especially in commercial applications, that data is just going missing. Uh, usually your data is not collected. Uh, it possibly can be used for some gaming activity. Most of the research, of course, in places would collect the data, but purposely, and, and we analyze them. But one of the things that I kind of hinted by suggesting and what we're doing in our lab is really let's study this data. Let's put that into a big AI machines, uh, which, which are the 
artificial intelligence and and give it to artificial intelligence and and start learning about human behavior so let's improve what we have uh by seeing if you're hyperactive or maybe you're bored and then the content will change uh to better provide you and suit you all right so our next question actually there's uh two questions that i think relate to each other um does this technology have applications in the defense industry? And what partnerships have you struck to start a proof of concept in particular industries? So I, I view these as two very similar questions. Does it have application to the defense industry? What sort of industries in general do you partner with um, and are, are working with you to try and develop this more? So um, definitely augmented reality and virtual reality are of a huge interest to the military. So uh, for, for various uh, uh, concept deal with amount of data that they uh, receive. Uh, but in general, this type of technology can go anywhere into any industry uh, it goes uh, to entertainment it goes to industry uh, any manufacturing would heavily um, enjoy and, and benefit from having eye tracking technology and virtual reality technology uh, available to them um, so so really you name technology and i'll name an application i think that's an easier answer uh, how uh, augmented or virtual reality can fit in and eye tracking in there as well all right and our last question um similar to that eye tracking question. Does wearing sunglasses or glasses of any kind impact tracking? Of course, I, that's a, a question near and dear to my heart. Yes, unfortunately it does. <laughs> um, so, but given said that, it really depends on the type of an eye tracker. So some eye tracker are dealing much better with this technology. Um, I have worked a lot with, um, um, glasses that are shutter glasses uh, for stereo and uh, the tracking was not impacted uh, but it's it really depends on what kind of glasses you're wearing and what kind of an eye tracker you have dr vignikov thank you so much uh, again as a reminder to all of our alumni who are watching here today uh, you will be able to connect with dr vignikov at the conclusion of this event uh, she will be available both by email and, of course, uh, by contacting the alumni office. We'll be happy to put you in touch. Dr. Vinikov, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So that has been our latest Highlander chat, Applications of Extended Reality, with Dr. Margarita Vinikov. My sincere thanks to the Yingwu College of Computing, which provided uh, Dr. Vinikov's work and research to us, as well as many other faculty uh, to come and connect with our alumni. For all those who are watching today, please remember to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where we will post these videos from time to time uh, on our social media pages. And we are also on podcasts. So please make sure to check us out on Apple, uh, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So it's been my pleasure to host you today. Again, my name is Mike Small, and I'm Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office. And as I like to say at the conclusion of all of our broadcasts, go Highlanders! <laughs>